and uh, they put a guy in there with them from the arm, from the army called the Colonel. Or his name was E.A.D. Uh, Colonel in the United States Army, who's another fascinating character. He's either a, a real hero, or he's crooked as a dog's hind leg, depending on who you ask. But he's a he's a fascinating guy. If you really want to read up on some interesting people. And they lock him into this hotel room, and they're like, "We want you. You'll come out until you build it. You design us an engine." They gave them access to the Bureau of Patents and Standards and said, "It's anything you want from there, you can use. You know, there's no trademark. Everything is free game." And they were all, they were given one instruction: N nothing experimental. We want you to go in there, and we want you to take current engine design and pick the best. And, and even enemy stuff was on the table. So they took like the cylinder heads from BMW and the valve train from you know from Packard and the crankshaft and bearings from Ford. They put it all together, and they go into the hotel room in May of 1917. In June, they come out with a design, and they come back to Detroit where they borrow. 300 draftsmen. You have to remember, this is, you know, there's no computer, there's no CAD, no CAM. This is all hand drawn, you know, stuff. So they, they come for the design, they come back here to Detroit, they get 300 draftsmen from Dodge, Packard, Cadillac, Pierce Arrow, and they come with a set of drawings. And the first eight cylinder prototype was delivered on July 4th, 1917. So May, June, July. Three months, and we had an engine. And it would prove to be a really, really good engine. It would change the way engines were designed from that point forward. And everybody copied it. So did it make an impact? We made two four-cylinders. We made 52 six-cylinders. Now, Mary, this, this engine could be built four, six, eight, twelve. It was modular. 15 eight cylinders. Mm -hmm. 20,478 of the V12s. <coughs> and it was a good engine. Uh, it was too big and too heavy for a lot of the current, like the SPAD, you wouldn't have been able, wouldn't, if the SPAD airframe wouldn't have been able to hold this engine. It was too heavy and too powerful. And they, they were designing, uh, Packard was actually designing a, a fighter plane. Unfortunately, the war ended. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, the war ended. <laughs> but uh, you know, the war ended before they they built a few of them. The pack and the, it was the Packard. It was a French aviation Lusac was helping them. So the Packard Lusac, they built the handful of them. It set a whole bunch of records in the twenties, but it never actually saw combat. There were only a couple of them made. And then there's a there's a data plate from one of the Ford Motor Company built. Uh, P12s. And then there's this major, Hap Arnold, standing with the first Liberty B12. What would, what would uh, Hap go on to do? Yeah. He became the father of the United States Air Force, first commanding general of the Air Force. So, I mean, here's an example where we really produced something that was it was a game changer, but again, the war ended abruptly. And it, but this engine, all everything after the, the Merlin, a lot of the tank engines, the T thirty four, the the Russian T thirty four tank was powered by an engine that was copied from one of these. So I mean, this this engine would go on and make a huge impact in, in the future. So I guess. It was like in a lot of the race boats that we saw, like the Miss America and all the, the, the Garwood boats, they all used they all used war surplus, the Liberty B12. So if you get to hear one of them run, it's the sweetest sounding engine. They make the coolest sound when they're on. So Armaments was another place where we played a role. Uh, anybody uh, anybody has to guess what what caused World War I to stagnate? Very good. Most, a lot of people will say it was the machine gun. The machine gun played a role, but it was definitely, World War I was an artillery war. And there was one particular piece of artillery 
that caused World War I to go the way it did? Prince 75? We got some really smart people in the room. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll sit on it. <laughs> but that's it. French 75. The gun, not the drink. Drink's not bad either. So, you know, similar to what we have in the work with, with the aircraft, the United States enters World War I, we're way behind the curve. And, and, the, and the French, the French had, had set the standard with, with the French 75. So we entered into the war and we, these, we just said, these are the guns we're going to make. So the French 75, 155, and 240, and the British 8 inch and 9.2 inch uh, howitzers. The French 75 was a game changer. So it was really the, the gun that changed warfare. Anybody know why? Well, rapid fire. But what one particular component on that gun made that possible? Well, they had uh, hydraulic pistons on it. The recuperator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in 1897, the French introduced the 75 millimeter. It was the first field piece to successfully employ a recuperator. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically a big shock absorber. So you've all seen like the old movies, the old like the old pirate ship where they fire the cannon and the cannonball goes that way and the cannon goes that way and they got to put it all back together again. And well, with the recuperator, you fire the gun, the shell goes that way, the gun stays where it was. So you're able to fire rapidly, accurately. It allowed for what we now refer to as indirect fire. You, this actually this this allowed you to have forward observers calling in adjustments. You know, we had great telephone and cable. You could have a guy up on a hill. You could have the guns way in the back. You could have a guy calling back saying, you know, left 200, drop 200, you know, fire for effect, go. That's where that started. And that was, uh, that was really the, what changed the, the war. So one of the big things is obviously you want recuperators on your guns. You've got to make them. So one of the things they did is they went to the Dodge Brothers. God really are kind of cool too. I wish they were still alive. I would love to go drinking with them. I bet you'd be fun. But they went to the Dodge Brothers and they're like, hey, can you guys make this recuperator thing? And they're like, I guess we can. But it was the same thing. The French made them one at a time, lovingly hand fitted. And the Dodge Brothers like, not anything out work. So they decided to uh, take it on and they were going to make the recuperators for the 75 and 155. Uh, they built a, a factory specifically for the production of the recuperators in Detroit. Uh, for those of you, once again, trivia pursuit question, it is, the plant was at the corner of Lynch and Mount Elliott. And they, it, the, the plant was retained, it was interesting, it was, it was retained by the government after the war. Because a lot of these, these were, this was also some of the very first, like we saw in World War, in World War II, the, the GOCO government owned contractor operated. So Dodge ran the plant, but the government paid for it, and when the war was over, the government took the plant back. And then they ended up taking all the, the tooling out of it, sending it to the Rock Island Arsenal, and then they gave the Dodge Brothers the land back at the end of the war. But they were able to reverse engineer the recuperator, <coughs> and by the end of the war, they were making 17 recuperators a day, which was way more than the French were able to produce. Uh, there is a chapter on this in the in the book, uh, the, the lovely book we have over here. A great cure for insomnia, by the way. Um, and this is kind of an eye chart, but I, I like to throw it in there. This is right out of the book, and this is for anybody out here who's a machinist. You can kind of see just how much what the machining is. I mean, this they went from you know 7,800 pound billets to you know, and they machined them down to practically you know, nothing. So there's a lot of machine work that went into these. And it was a, it was a lot of work, but they, the Dodge Brothers were able to do it, and they were able to, to make a lot of these recuperators. Another thing, uh, Detroit, uh, we made some gun tubes here. Uh, when we went the end of the war, there were only four plants in the United States that, knew, that were capable of making gun tubes. And they decided to expand that to 19. One of them was right here in Detroit, uh, Chalkis Manufacturing Company, uh, six, $607,000 to build the plant. It's kind of funny. That's just the OSHA payoff today, right? And 
they were making the three-inch uh, anti-aircraft guns, the three per day. When the plant, when the war ended once again, it was a go code. They shut the plant down, tore it down. Uh, okay, then obviously caissons. Uh, for those of you, uh, anybody army here want to sing the song? <laughs> caissons go rolling along. Uh, caisson is a is a support vehicle that's used with artillery that's used to carry tools and ammunition. Caissons and limbers. And obviously, in an artillery intensive war like World War I was, caissons and limbers become very important. And a lot of the stuff that's in the caisson is very similar to, to automotive. It's just really like a front, it's a front axle from a car. And it's, uh, the car companies really jumped in with both feet and began building caisson. And why did they matter? We kind of talked a little bit about the uh, introduction of the French 75 and quick firing artillery. Uh, quick firing artillery really in increased the ammunition consumption, obviously. Prior to the introduction of the recuperator, uh, your, each gun would have one and a half caissons supporting it. With the introduction, it, that jumped up to three. So for every single gun, you had now had three caissons. So for every single gun, you had four vehicles and four horse teams or four tractors at, at later in the war. Your artillery training got to be ridiculously long in this war. Uh, the French and the Americans, we, we modeled everything on the French. The French reduced the size of their artillery training because they realized that they didn't need as many guns because you had more fire from less guns. So again, the trivia pursuit question. Uh, the German Corps had 144 guns, the French only had 92, but actually had a better and more accurate volume of fire. Uh, American Car and Foundry Company, here, right here in Detroit, uh, manufactured caissons. Uh, at one point in time, the American Car and Foundry plant was the largest artillery park in the United States. There were more artillery vehicles parked in that plant than there were at military bases, because we they were building them so fast. Uh, so you can see this is that's, that's American Car and Foundry. That is the uh, that's their back lot waiting for delivery. <coughs> that is one of the one of the caissons up there. I love I love the camo. That's such a that's such an awesome color. How much of that is wood? Like a lot. The there's a lot of wood. There's a there's a guy here in the air that, that has one. He has an American Car and Foundry, and a lot of the the box was steel, but most of the running here and, and was wood. And then over there is the, is the uh, production line. And once again, you got Rosie's mom. You see a lot of female workers working on those. So some of the other stuff that the auto companies were doing, obviously American Car and Foundry was making uh, the caissons for 75 millimeter. Uh, Dodge Brothers were making windlasses and shot trucks for the 240 howitzers. <coughs> Ford was making 4.7 inch caissons. Uh, Maxwell Motors, Studebaker was making 4.7s. So I mean, a lot of people were in on this, and we built a lot of stuff. We also built a lot of ammunition here. Once again, with the uh, with the automotive industry being centered here in the, in the Detroit metropolitan or southeastern Michigan in particular. We had a lot of casting capability, a lot of machining capability, and the hand grenade is really just a lump of cast iron. They, we made a lot of projectiles. We didn't fill, they, the projectiles were made here, they were machined here, and then they were sent somewhere else to have the powder put in them. There wasn't a lot of powder production here. There was some, uh, was Atlas Center was doing some powder here, but most of it was on the East Coast. But we made a lot of the rounds. earlier, but some of the stuff that was made here, Page, Maxwell Motors, a lot, of the car, a lot of those classic car companies that disappeared, Motor Motors, Sparks and Withington, Sparks and Withington built a lot of stuff during World War I and a lot of stuff during World War II, that was a, that's a company that really jumped into the war production with both feet and both wars. Studebaker, 
U.S. Radiator, Wilson Foundry. You know, there was a, a, in excess of 3.5 million rounds of ammunition produced. And again, a lot of it did not make it over. A lot of it went to Lake Water Belief and places on the East Coast. And then when the war was over, they took, put it in barges, they took it out into the ocean, and they dumped it. So it's down there somewhere. Textile is not work. Along with a bunch of mustard gas. They did the same thing with the mustard gas we made here in Dow County. Took it and dumped it in the ocean. So one place where we were not behind the curve is vehicles. I like the home. Henry Ford was involved uh, pre-1917 with the production of ambulances. The uh, American Ambulance Corps, a lot of volunteers, went over to France in 1914, 15, 16. Uh, this is the 1916 version of the ambulance. Uh, they made a lot of these that were shipped over to uh, France prior to the American entry in the war. These were made here at Highland Park. Uh, you can tell the 1916 version. You see the little box on the back, and little, that's actually the stretcher sticking out, and then there was a little box on the bottom for the guy's feet. They didn't make it long enough for people to lay in there. The 1917-18 the version, they corrected that they made them longer. Uh, but again, that version, very few were made, didn't make it overseas. This particular version, there were a ton of them that were, that were sent over. And they saw extensive use with the French and, and the American forces. <clears throat> and there's one being loaded up. Did Ford make any of their European operations? Because I think they were making model Ts. Yes, yes. There was there there was the 19th. The, that was the pr production version, and there was also a French production version, which differs slightly. It was used more like a beadboard. Uh, the wood that was made out of was lower quality because they were running out of stuff over there. Uh, but one place that so we, we, we were well, we were already well on our way to motorizing the, the military by 1917. Uh, we had used some vehicles in the punitive expedition against Pancho Villa. Uh, General Pershing famously bought the Cadillac and was cruising around in the Mexico, Mexico with it. They also had a couple of Dodges. First documented test. Uh, I know that Ernest Hemingway was an ambulance driver in, in Italy in the First World War. Was he driving a Ford ambulance, do you know? Did we supply I, any ambulances to the Russians or the Italians? I'm uh, not sure what he drove. I don't, Ford was primarily that went to France that I know of. Uh, but Buick was also making ambulances during the war, so there was a bunch of them. But I don't know what Hemingway drove. Uh, I, Walt Disney drove. There's photographs of Walt Disney in the uh, volunteer ambulance service driving a Ford. So Walt Disney actually did drive a Ford. But Hemingway, I'm not sure what he had. That was an interesting question. I have to look that up. Disney lied about his age. Yeah. In there. But uh, so the first documented test of a military vehicle was done at West Point in 1904, and then they kind of said, "Oh, these are kind of cute," and then they went back to their horses. And in 1912, they really kind of gave it some serious thought and started to kind of think about it. And one of the things that came around was the Liberty Truck. Uh, 1914, there was this entity called the Society of Automotive Engineers. Uh, they still exist. And their primary goal at that point in time was to, they, want, they were driving for standardization. They wanted standardization, standardization, standardization. So one of the things they came up with was, let's make a standardized truck. <coughs> the idea behind it was that you were going to design a truck, Liberty Model A, Liberty Model B, is what they came to be called. So, so the United States government wouldn't have to go out and buy a Ford or buy a Buick or buy a Chevy or buy a Packard. They would, they would go out and they'd say, we need 200 Liberty Model A's. And then the car companies, the idea behind it was that they, that they could, you could have one company make axles, one company make bodies, one company make chassis, one company make wheels. All the parts would be shipped to a military base and they would put them together and make a truck. I like a really cool idea. It proved to be somewhat less practical in, in the real world, but it was it was an interesting way to try and try and avoid favoritism. So they hashed out a standard A and standard B design. They came to be called the Liberties during the war, and uh, 